Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on extracting metals. Now, before you watch this video, make sure you are comfortable with bonding models, and particularly the stuff in that video on metallic bonding and also on the reactivity of metals. I've got videos on both of those earlier in this playlist. Now, in this video, we'll be looking at oxidation and reduction. Then we'll be um, exploring how we can extract metals by heating them with carbon, and then by electrolysis, and then we'll look at some alternative methods of extracting metals, um, the importance of recycling, and then finally the life cycle assessment of materials. Okay, so let's start by looking at reduction and oxidation reactions, which help us to understand um, how metals change during a chemical reaction. Um, we'll be looking on this slide at oxidation and reduction in terms of oxygen, and so then we can define reduction as when a metal in a compound loses oxygen, and oxidation as when an element on its own gains oxygen and we tend to combine the two together to talk about a redox reaction um, in which when one substance is oxidized another is reduced and we always combine the two together because you can't have a reduction without oxygen if one substance is losing oxygen it must be giving it somewhere so something else must be gaining oxygen so reduction and oxidation always happen together now displacement reactions are examples of redox reactions and in a displacement reaction the more reactive metal gets oxidized so it will start out as an element and it will gain the oxygen whereas the less reactive metal will get reduced it will start out in a compound and lose the oxygen so for example we might have say iron oxide reacting with carbon okay now if we check our reactivity series up here we've got iron is there on our reactivity series carbon up here so carbon is more reactive um, iron is less reactive and you can see that the carbon gets oxidized it gains oxygen whereas the iron gets reduced it loses oxygen um, because the um, the more reactive substance will gain that oxygen it will become oxidized um, second example we might have magnesium and zinc oxide now magnesium is up here it is more reactive zinc is down here less reactive so mag magnesium because it is more reactive is able to displace the less reactive zinc and so the more reactive substance ends up getting oxidized gaining oxygen whilst the less reactive one ends up getting reduced um, and losing oxygen okay right now another way to think about oxidation and reduction is in terms of the movement of electrons okay now this is higher tier material so if you're foundation you can just skip straight through this slide when a metal gains oxygen it also loses electrons why would that be well let's just think about oxygen here oxygen um, if we think about the electrons in its outer shell it's got one two three four five six electrons because it's in group six so whenever it reacts with things it will gain two more and it will gain them by taking them away from a metal. And so when a metal reacts with oxygen, the oxygen takes its electrons and causes the metal to lose electrons. So this leads to this idea, a different way of describing oxidation, where we describe oxidation as being the loss of electrons and reduction as being the gain of electrons. And we use this little mnemonic to help us remember it. So we say oil, oxidation, is loss, and rig, reduction, is gain. So oil rig is a really useful way to help us remember reduction and oxidation in terms of electrons. So let's have a look at one of the examples from the previous slide, uh, magnesium and zinc oxide, making magnesium oxide and zinc. Now if we focus on the magnesium, the magnesium starts out as magnesium metal, and in the magnesium oxide, it is an Mg2 plus ion. So what's happening to the magnesium is starting out as Mg, forming Mg2 plus and two electrons. So the magnesium has been oxidized because it has lost electrons. Okay. Equally, the zinc starts out as Zn2 plus in the zinc oxide, and it ends up as just Zn on its own as a pure element. So the zinc has gone from two plus, it's gained two electrons and become just regular zinc on its own. So because it's gained electrons, we can describe that as a reduction. 
Importantly, metals that are lower down the reactivity series are harder to oxidize because they attract electrons more strongly. So if we look at our reactivity series, um, the most reactive um, uh, metals at the top are the easiest to oxidize. And the least reactive one, ones at the bottom are the hardest to oxidize um, because they're grabbing onto their electrons, attracting their electrons more strongly. Okay, so let's move on to ores. Now, an ore is a rock containing enough of a metal or a metal compound to make it profitable to extract. Now, that's an unusual definition because uh, in chemistry, we don't often talk about profit. But the reason why we say this is because most rocks contain all sorts of different metals, but often not in a high enough concentration to make it worthwhile extracting them. So we only call it an ore once there's enough metal in it to make it worthwhile extracting. Now, ores are usually oxides or sulfides of a particular metal. So we might have um, iron ore might be iron oxide, um, tin ore might be, say, tin sulfide, something like that. Now, in order to get the metal out of the ore, we must reduce the ore. So we're going to need to remove the oxygen or return electrons to the metal um, atoms. Now, we can do that in one of two ways. We can either heat them with carbon or we can use electrolysis. I won't go into detail just yet because we'll look at that in more detail on the next slide. Now, the least reactive metals, for example, silver and gold, are often found in their native state. That means they actually exist as elements rather than as compounds. And we can see that here. So um, if we look at this rock here, we can see these kind of little patches of actual pure gold scattered throughout this piece of gold ore. And sometimes we actually find whole lumps of gold like this, which we call, call a gold nugget. Now, gold like uh, you know, metals that are found in their, in their native state do not need reducing in order to extract them because they are already there in their elemental form. Okay, so let's look at our first method for extracting metals. Um, and this works for metals that are less reactive than carbon. So what we can do is we can heat the metal ore with carbon and extract the metals that way. Now, when I say heat with carbon, I don't just mean like sort of gently warm it with a Bunsen burner. I mean, we need to use really serious temperatures of kind of a thousand degrees Celsius plus. And so we do that in this great big piece of factory equipment called a blast furnace. This thing might be sort of 40 or 50 meters tall. And the way this works is we put our iron ore and carbon dioxide in the top of this enormous great piece of equipment. And we blast it with this really, really hot air that goes in there. And that kicks off these really intense chemical reactions that lead to molten iron being produced and coming out of the bottom. Now, the equation for that looks like this. So iron oxide plus carbon are going to make carbon dioxide and iron. Um, we can say two Fe2O3s, that's iron oxide, will react with three carbons to make three carbon dioxides and four ions, Fe. Now, we can view this as a displacement reaction because carbon displaces the iron from the iron oxide because carbon is more reactive than the iron. We can also view this as a redox reaction because the iron gets reduced. It loses oxygen. Look, the iron starts out as iron oxide with those oxygens there and it ends up all on its lonesome like that with no oxygens at all. So it's lost its oxygen. Equally, the carbon is oxidized because it gains oxygen. Look, it starts out as carbon on its own and ends up bonded to oxygen in the carbon dioxide. We can also, if we're doing higher tier, explain this in terms of electrons as well. So remember, at higher tier, reduction is also gaining electrons and our iron starts out as Fe3 plus ions gaining three electrons to become regular iron atoms. And equally, we can consider the carbon to be starting out as carbon atoms and sort of losing electrons to become carbon four plus ions. And oxidation is loss of electrons as well as uh, gaining oxygen. Now, our heating with carbon method only works for metals that are less reactive than carbon. However, metals that are more reactive than carbon cannot be displaced by it 
and so therefore we need a different method which we call electrolysis. Now during electrolysis what happens is that the metal ore is heated until it melts and then a large electric current is passed through it and we collect the pure metal at the negative electrode. So for example if we were trying to extract aluminium from aluminium ore because it is more reactive than carbon we have to use this electrolysis. So we melt our aluminium oxide which is the ore and we will end up collecting at the negative electrode we collect our aluminium and at the positive electrode we collect our um, we collect some oxygen gas and that just bubbles off into the air. Now this looks like this. So we have this kind of great big container. Now there are kind of a few different parts of the container. Um, in the middle of it we have our aluminium oxide. This is our aluminium ore and we melt it until it is a we heat it until it melts and forms a liquid. Now the container has two parts to it. The, the inside of the container is coated with um, graphite which, which conducts electricity and a negative charge is attached to it. So the walls of the container have this negative charge and in the top we put these positive electrodes like that. Okay, And so what happens is all the aluminium ions will go to those negative walls of the container and they'll pick up a load of electrons and they will turn into uh, aluminium atoms and so they'll collect as molten aluminium at the bottom and they'll leave the container and we can collect the aluminium and do what we want with it. That's the fine details. You don't need all that level of detail. Just knowing that electrolysis is used is all you need. And in terms of what this actually looks like in a real factory, it's something like that. So you have these great big banks of all this um, big containers with electrolysis happening in it. Now, this is a redox reaction, okay? But it is not a displacement reaction. It's not displacement because there's nothing displacing the aluminium from the aluminium oxide. But it is redox because the aluminium is reduced. The aluminium loses oxygen and it also gains electrons. Um, either of those definitions uh, are both satisfied. So you can see there the aluminium 3 plus gaining three electrons to form aluminium. We can also see how aluminium starts off with oxygen and it ends up losing it like that. And equally the oxygen is oxidized. Now that sounds a bit mad because the oxygen can't really gain oxygen so that definition doesn't work for us, but it does lose electrons. It starts out as oxide ions, O2 minus, and loses those to form oxygen molecules. Okay, so let's compare our two types of metal extraction. So if we start by looking at heating uh, things with carbon, uh, which types of metals are involved in that? Well, and that is any metal that is less reactive than carbon. Um, for example, um, iron, zinc, and copper. Um, and this is a redox reaction because the metal in the ore gets reduced whilst the carbon gets oxidized and it's also a displacement reaction because the carbon can displace the metal from the ore because it's more reactive. Now why do we do this? The pros of it and um, the big pro is that it is cheaper and that's due to the availability of carbon which we can get from uh, coal just by digging it out of the ground. The downside of it though is that it leads to higher carbon dioxide emissions um, and that contributes to climate change because this releases large amounts of carbon dioxide both in the actual chemical reaction but also in terms of generating the high temperatures to make the reaction happen in the first place. Now um, electrolysis then, the metals that we do electrolysis or extract by electrolysis, um, those are any metals that are more reactive than carbon. Um, for example aluminium, magnesium and calcium and we do that because carbon's not, uh, not reactive enough to displace them, so we've got to use electrolysis instead. Um, so what type of reaction is it? It's only a redox reaction. There's no displacement here because there's no um, sort of additional element being added in order to make the displacement happen. Now, why we do this? Well, it can be lower carbon dioxide emissions if renewable electricity is used to uh, conduct the electrolysis. Uh, the downside of it is that it is expensive and the reason why is because of the large quantity of electricity that is used to do this. Okay, so let's look at some alternative methods of extracting metals. Uh, method number one is phyto extraction. Now the idea here is we start with some plants that are grown in metal rich soil. And so you can see here all these little orange circles, they represent metal ions that are present in the soil. Now as the plant grows, 
those metal ions will accumulate in the leaves. We can see those little orange circles are now in the leaves of the plant. They've been taken up by the roots and brought into the leaves. So if we then burn the plants, this produces an ash that is rich in all of those metal ions that were in the plant. Now, this is potentially really useful because it can make metal reserves last longer and it means we can extract metal from ores that are currently too low concentration to be able to use uh, to be able to extract the metals from normally um, and it reduces the need for mining as well and mining is a major source of environmental pollution the downside of it is the really big downside is that it's slow now it's important to state that phyto extraction is not currently used uh, on a commercial scale anywhere to extract metals for use although it is used in some places to remove metals that might be contaminating soil uh, from industrial waste and things like that um, the next method we got, the next alternative method is called bio leaching. Now in this, what we do is we start with some bacteria and we grow them again on metal ores that are low quality. They've got a low concentration of the metal in them. And this produces a very metal rich solution called a leachate. And what we can then do with that solution, we can extract the metals from that leachate through processes like electrolysis or displacement, depending on what the metal is. Now the pros of this, again, it could make metal reserves last longer because it allows us to extract metal from ores that are currently too uh, low concentration for normal methods. Um, and the big cons of it are that it is slow. Um, unlike phyto extraction, bioleaching actually is conducted um, particularly on uh, ores of gold and copper. Um, and that is currently a viable technology, although only in a few mines around the world. It's not a major thing yet. Now the next thing to look at is the idea of recycling uh, metals. Now, a lot of what I'll say um, is directly about metals, but actually it applies to all kinds of recycling. So recycling in the context of metals is collecting and melting down scrap metal to allow us to reuse it. Now, this is a really, really good thing because it means that our metal reserves last longer because there's reduced uh, and there's reduced pollution from mining. We're not having to dig up fresh metal um, ores from the ground, we can just reuse the metal that we've already extracted. Um, and it can lower our energy costs as well because melting down and reusing metal uses much less energy than, you know, all the, you know, think about all the big uh, machinery involved in mining it and then the, you know, the massive factories required to melt it in blast furnaces and, you know, all that kind of extraction takes a lot of energy. Simply melting it down and reusing it takes much less energy. Um, the downsides of this, though, um, are that the metals must be collected and transported, which takes a lot of infrastructure, and it also um, creates its own um, carbon dioxide emissions as you do that. And then the sorting the metals can be difficult. You know, imagine you collect all your metal; it might look something like that. You've got to try and separate out all of the different metals um, to be melt to be recycled in slightly different processes. And it also means that we end up with lots of impurities in the metal, and they've got to be removed as well. So recycling is definitely a good thing but it's not without some minor disadvantages. Okay, so the last thing we're going to look at is the idea of a life cycle assessment. Okay? Now, a life cycle assessment is about measuring the environmental impacts at all stages of a product's life, because we only tend to see the environmental impacts when we're actually using a product ourselves. But, you know, the product's got to be come from somewhere and it goes somewhere after we've used it as well. So we've got to think about all those different environmental impacts. Now, if we start with looking at the raw materials, so these are the, you know, the, the ores that are used to produce the metals that the items made from or, you know, whatever it might be. So we, when we think about our raw materials, there are, there are environmental impacts associated with mining them or getting them out of the ground or growing them or whatever the process might be. And there are environmental impacts from transporting them from where they're mined towards the factories as well. Okay. So our next, our next aspect of the life cycle assessment is the manufacture. So our factory taking in those raw materials and turning them into the products that we know and use. And there are lots of different environmental impacts here as well. There's the environmental impacts of the energy that is used to make the products, of the land that's used uh, for the factories, and also of the waste products from the factories as well. OK. So the next thing to think about is the uh, environmental impact of actually using a product. And that's what we're most familiar with. So if you think about something like a car, um, you know, there's a lot of environmental impact there in terms of the carbon emissions from the fuel that it burns or the other energy sources it might use. Um, but also things to do with the maintenance as well. You know, think about having to replace the tyres every kind of 
few thousand miles or having to change the oil and all those other impacts from actually maintaining the items and keeping them in good condition. And lastly, once we finish with an item, there are environmental impacts from disposing of it as well. You know, is it going to go to landfill, which creates huge amounts of pollution and environmental harm? Or is it going to be recycled, which is better than landfill, but also has its own impacts as well? OK, now, one of the things we need to be able to do is to be able to analyse data from a life cycle assessment. So, for example, um, if we do this, we can it can help us identify where improvements can be made that can reduce the environmental harm. So if we think about, for example, a mobile phone, um, the different aspects of the life cycle assessment look, look like this. So the raw materials and manufacturing stage actually emits 50 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Using a phone for two entire years only emits 10 grams of carbon dioxide and disposing of the phone only produces about two kilograms of carbon dioxide. So if we're a designer thinking about what can we do to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions from a phone, we're going to be wanting to look at the raw materials and the manufacturing aspects because that's where the vast majority of the carbon dioxide emissions are produced. So by understanding the emissions and the other environmental harms at different points in the life cycle, we can make better choices about how to reduce the environmental impact that we're having and to help us be more sustainable. Okay, so that's it, the end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.